Hello and welcome to another episode of A Closer Look. Thank you for joining us. And of course, Happy International Women's Day. Commemorated on the 8th of March annually is the International Women's Day. This is theme being Investing in Women Accelerate Progress. Now, while PNG as a developing nation has taken significant strides towards encouraging women empowerment and gender equality in the efforts to accelerate progress, there is no denying women still face prevailing challenges and disparities in the country. According to findings by UN Women, at prime working age, only 61% of women are in the labor force versus 90% of men. This, to some extent, highlights the evident need for equal women participation in nation building. Additionally, United Nations Development Plan or UNDP revealed that the state of women's rights in the country remains alarming as Papua New Guinea ranks 169 out of 170 countries in the 2021 UNDP Gender Inequality Index, with only Afghanistan lagging further behind. It also stated that furthermore, rates of gender-based violence remain stubbornly among the world's highest, affecting about two in every three women. Experts predict that equal participation by women in Papua New Guinea's economy would boost GDP per capita by 20% within a generation. This sentiment was expressed by the Australian High Commission's Deputy Head of Mission, Dr John Londes. You know, it's this sort of day that provides us an opportunity both to look forward but also to reinforce that everyone does have a role to play in forging a more equitable world. Um, and progress only happens when women and girls are included. Our own Foreign Minister, Australia's Foreign Minister, has recently said that greater political and economic participation by women makes societies wealthier and more peaceful. And that's not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. Um, greater political, greater security, greater economic participation by women just makes us wealthier, more peaceful, gives us all greater opportunities. Building on this was the United Nations resident coordinator to Papua New Guinea, Richard Howard, who said days such as the International Women's Day should place a spotlight on the challenges present for women. But on these international days, I think we, we focus on the, on, the, on the realities that we also face, the challenges ahead. And only when we work together in partnership will we be able to overcome those challenges. So. There's only one way to go up, and we really have to do better together in partnership. And that brings us to women, because women, no doubt, in the families, in PNG and many places in the world, deal with the brunt of the challenges on a daily basis. When there is no food, when there is no safety, uh, when families must move, when they're displaced, it is women who have to find the way forward. So we recognize their resilience and their the power of women to overcome even the, those darkest of days. But really, when this theme, if we look at this theme, which is inclusion, inclusion, what does that mean? And more than anything, when we look at a parliament with only three women, with only three women, this is really one of the lowest rates of women's participation in government, inclusion in government in the world. And there's certainly no lack of incredible women in this country. And those women in parliament now set an example of what can be done. But there are many more out there that should have a seat at the table. Elaborating on the need for women leaders in parliament, the coordinator noted the subject of special temporary measures. And there are ways, 
uh, in many countries to rapidly increase the number of women in those leadership positions through what we call special temporary measures. We must implement these. Two years ago, the Deputy Secretary of the Gen General of the UN visited Papua New Guinea, and she spoke to the highest levels of government and had a commitment to implement those measures in this country. But that is still not done. And I believe, we all believe, everyone here knows, that when women hold positions of power, they have a special eye on the needs of families for health and education, water and sanitation, because they live that reality. They're the ones ultimately responsible to deliver for families. So to take that perspective to government will be begin to shift, shift the focus and channel resources to, to the line ministries like this ministry, which have to deliver for people. He further elaborates on the special temporary measures using a case study of Nepal. So special temporary measures are measures certain kinds of allocations and provisions government makes uh, for short term to get women in those key positions. They also implemented a, a policy, a law, that required that all governors or deputy governors, one of those positions in each district, be given to a woman. So within a space of two weeks, all of a sudden you had half of your local government officials, local governments being run by women. So these kind of measures could be taken. Now, in terms of human development indicators, does it directly translate to an increase? Not necessarily. But we do know, and research shows across the world, that when women are in power, they tend to allocate more resources towards those basic needs of, of people. So, you know, those in which we would see those development indicators going up. So our proposal, and this isn't a magic bullet, but it is taking us in the right direction. On Women's Day, we focus and we commit to promoting special temporary measures to get more women into power in country and help us steer this country along a more productive course that will deliver better for people. In the efforts to embrace women empowerment and gain gender equality, Mr. Howard elaborates on the importance of partnership. So what we want to see from this Women's Day forward is greater participation of women in government, women in leadership positions at all levels, and to take those measures to make it happen in a quick way. And the UN is ready to support in designing and supporting and implementing those measures, special temporary measures. So, Recommitting Australia's support for PNG in this front as well was Dr. Londes. So we've been extremely pleased to be able to support um, the government of Papua New Guinea's efforts um, led by Minister Peter and Secretary Abase and his team to invest in and accelerate gender equality in PNG. So we're looking forward to um, Papua New Guinea's new national policy on gender equality and women's empowerment. And we're also looking forward to, um, uh, to what you're able to achieve, Secretary and Minister, um, when you go to the CWS and reporting back on the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. As a result of noticeable efforts so far in PNG in the space of women empowerment, in 2023, the former Special Parliamentary Committee on Gender-Based Violence became a permanent parliamentary committee on gender equality and women's empowerment. At the same time, women MPs from the National Parliament, including the recently elected Francisca Somerso, and from the Bougainville House of Representatives came together to form the Joint Parliamentary Women's Caucus and issued a joint declaration on women in leadership. The Secretary for Community Development, Youth and Religion, Jerry Ubase, assures that the government is committed to ensure equal opportunities for women. That the government is serious in its efforts to eradicate practices that impedes the achievement, the advancement of women in all aspects of their lives. It recognizes the challenges, the challenges faced by mothers and daughters and has prioritized reviewing legislation and policy to address these challenges and empower women and girls of this national policy. 
Government efforts to achieve the objective under strategy priority area number 11.4 of the medium term development plan. We must realize that to achieve <coughs> government slogans, uh, slogan to leave no one behind, all women, men, boys, and girls must have equal rights and opportunities at all levels of life in this great nation. We now take a quick break and when we return, we will place a spotlight on the ongoing fuel war in Papua New Guinea. Welcome back to a closer look. Papua New Guinea is in the midst of a recurring fuel dilemma that relates to disruptions in its fuel supply and distribution since its biggest fuel supplier, Puma Energy PNG, signaled possible shutdown due to foreign exchange issues on January 25th this year. Despite other potential suppliers such as Mobile and Total trying to assist, impacts can be clearly seen. Government intervention continues to center around discussions with Bank of PNG and Bank South Pacific to extend Puma's contract. PNG operates a crawling peg exchange rate that requires the Bank of Papua New Guinea to ration availability of foreign exchange, which has become a major headwind for business. Puma Energy has cited a lack of access to foreign exchange as one of the main reasons for the rationing of aviation fuel, although BPNG's regulatory probes into the company's activities have also curtailed its access to banking services. This, however, is not a new case. A similar scenario presented itself in July 2022 when Puma Energy raised concern over its treatment under the Bank of PNG's Special Purpose Audit and the removal of FX market access. Puma Energy Chairman and Managing Director Hulala Tokome said they would need 183.3 million kina in foreign exchange orders every month to trade and restock all pumps. Effectively, this meant suspending all of the company's previously planned 562.63 million kina growth investment program. Early in February 2023, Puma issued a similar alert when it was hit with foreign exchange crisis, forcing the liquefied petroleum gas supplier to shut down, except to emergency service providers such as hospitals and law enforcement agencies. BPNG began a special purpose audit of Puma Energy, which led to court proceedings last year and has now turned into a long-running dispute over its forex requirements. On the 5th of January 2024, Puma's forex issues re-emerged, sending the country into another frenzy. Under emergency declaration, the government ordered central bank to allow authorized banks to continue to supply necessary foreign exchange to Puma Energy. The declaration also directed Puma Energy to refrain from reducing or stopping supply of fuel, and Prime Minister James Marape flagged significant fines for non-compliance. And under Section 3, uh, the cabinet recommended to our head of state to make emergency declarations, and the emergency declarations were uh, made, uh, and the declarations uh, includes the, the head of state authorizes the requisition and use of Napa Napa refinery and related infrastructure belonging to Puma uh, companies for and in connection with uh, fuel storage and fuel supply, so that petroleum products uh, continuously uh, brought into this facility for uh, for uh, redistribution into uh, the transport uh, sector in our country so that the services are not sabotaged uh, and are stopped. 
These shortages are becoming more frequent, affecting business and personal travel, and ongoing fuel rationing measures are certain to continue impacting flight services and are affecting wider business operations, public and private transportation services, and ground services. Taxi driver Bob Richard shares his struggles with the current dilemma. I'm a taxi driver, I'm a taxi driver, no bus, no mostly CDM. I'm a running bus, no taxi in general city, but I'm a capital city, no bus, no city. I'm a man, Mary, I'm a busy staff, and I'm a mimic, I'm a container, go come, no city, pull my fuel, all the 20 in a 30 in a M12, 50 in a above, and all the no garner. I'm a crisis, no fuel, so. Puma Energy's decision to restrict fuel distribution since January 25th has caused Puma Energy's decision to restrict fuel distribution since January 25th has raised concerns about a potential national shutdown from industry leaders, shadow ministers, businesses and the public. Shadow Minister for Petroleum and Energy and International Trade and Investment, Karenga Kua, highlights further. So every bank, commercial bank in this country, Kina, Westpac, ANZ, BSP, they all have their correspondent bank overseas. And those relationships are, are premised on the basis of respecting international rules of commerce and transactions. In order to participate, have your banking done by any one of those, you have to observe the proper rules of conduct. Puma's parent company, Trafigura, has got very, very serious questions about the integrity internationally, starting from Central America to South America to Myanmar to Africa. Building on Minister Kua's sentiments is alternate Prime Minister Alan Byrd. They have not told us yet how they're going to fix the energy crisis. Time first, uh, problem come up on the Puma. Many of us, we were in government. We made a simple suggestion. Kisim Kumul Petroleum Holdings, Yusim Desla, how much billion dollars is in of Singapore? Buy out Puma, solve our problem. Other field providers, including ExxonMobil and Total Energies, have attempted to maintain normal operations, albeit with certain limitations, in affected areas. Puma is a large purchaser of foreign currencies in the country and says it needs to do so to operate its business. PNG is an exporter of crude oil and liquefied natural gas, but a lack of processing capacity means that it relies on imports for fuel, which is supplied by Puma Energy and Total Energies. Prime Minister Marape states the government is resorting to enhance processing capacity and build reserves. In the long term, we also look at possibility of setting up uh, 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 with Kumul and subsidiaries additional infrastructure for fuel storage. We're looking at working with U.S. under the Defense Cooperation Agreement for possibility of fuel bunkering in Ley uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, Port Mosby and possibly Manus for long-term fuel security. This is something we're working on in our national interest to have fuel storage that is not dependent on companies uh, and, and selling fuel to us, but as a nation, securing our energy security in the fuel bunkering and fuel storage that Kumul Petroleum Holdings is tasked to get out there and have a look into. Roundtable talks are underway as the government urgently tries to navigate a pathway out of this situation. We take a quick breather now and when we return, we will take a closer look at the ill-fated landslide that occurred in Western Highlands Province. You're watching A Closer Look. In this segment, we follow the story of the people of Kinjibamala LLG in the Day District as they mourn the deaths of four of their own to a landslide that took place in the Western Highlands Province. With heavy rains experienced in most parts of the Upper Highlands region this past month, 
this has had an impact on the soil. Unfortunately, the four family members didn't make it out in time and were buried by the swallowing mess of soil. The son and grandfather died under the force of the landslide the same day and the remains retrieved while the daughter and father were found the next day. Yesterday marked a week since the people of Malawan in Day district of the Western Highlands province lost four of their own to a day landslide. <laughs> Governor of Western Highlands province Wai Rapa in his capacity presented 20,000 kina cash to the affected community as well as to water pumps for the use in the retrieval of the remains. Bodies of Nimrod Low and his grandfather Penny Pooled were retrieved with the help of to 50-meter water pumps and generators that were supplied to the Malakinjibi people from Governor Rapa. Former Ward Councillor Malakinjibi thanked the Governor for responding to the call immediately. A local councillor from the area said a large mess of soil and rocks slid down the slope and buried the family while they were doing their gardening on Saturday the 2nd of March. Nine-year-old Pamela Lowe's body was found on Sunday along with their father who sustained injuries but sadly died due to his injuries at the Kujib Hospital. One survivor of the landslide, Sharon Joshua, shared her experience. A local spokesperson from the area also said that villagers should be made aware of long-term solutions to mitigate landslide, improve road as well as coming up with ways such as planting trees to support the soil. Governor Rapa also advised locals to take precautions. So can please stop on the mountain or on the big river. Or oh, you want to carry your own road too, please. Ground broken, or this like a landslide, and come a big plot too long. So you must take a precautions, no car. You want to car, no night. You drive too, you got big rain, or this like you must see precautions. So no this like too, on a long road, you go on the same long. At the water commands, me are on the same road.
that's all we have for you on this episode of A Closer Look. Join us same time next week for another episode. On behalf of the entire team, thank you for watching and have a pleasant evening.